My name is Hugo Hinsley, and I'm one of the directors of the graduate school here in the Architectural Association. Many of you may know the Architectural Association. It's a very old foundation from uh, 160 years ago, <coughs> formed by frustrated pupils in architectural offices. There was no education for architects. The universities didn't teach architecture at that time. So they formed an association and rented rooms and started to invite people to come and discuss architecture with them and set up a library. And from that grew the school. And the AA School of Architecture is now one of the prominent schools of architecture in the world with about a, a community of about a thousand people. Uh, and one of the things we do is to also have an open door policy about all of the activities we have here. So unlike some universities where you have to have swipe cards and you can't get in, we do the opposite. We encourage people to come in and come to events. And we also, from time to time, offer the spaces of the school for parallel organizations having similar activities. So I'm very pleased to welcome you to the AA for this evening. After the event, there will be drinks and things to eat in the side room at the back of the lecture hall. So have courage. And I'll hand over now to the chairman of the LRG, Paul Tabush. Thank you, Hugh. Um, and welcome to you all. Welcome to members of the AA, members of the Landscape Research Group, and to guests. Um, it's a particular delight to welcome to the, to the annual lecture in this august building. I'm learning that the uh, AA has got something in common with the Landscape Research Group. Um, so I want to thank um, the AA for co-sponsoring this and, and for offering these premises to us. And also to Antonia Nusia, who organises this on behalf of uh, the Landscape Research Group, and Hugh Hinsley, who introduced me, um, who, who's very kindly also collaborated in setting this up. He tells me that the AA is an educational association. Um, we heard today, we had a meeting of the Landscape Research Group. We, we discussed who we were, we always do, and, uh, and what we do. And um, actually, um, it was your tonight's speaker who came up with the phrase that we create critical discursive spaces. And that struck a chord with a few of us, I think, and we've been dis dis discussing it since. Um, so I want to say a little bit about Landscape Research Group, and then I'll hand over um, and, and introduce Jackie. Um, there are some leaflets on the front here, which uh, are, are flyers for the Landscape Research Group. So if you're not a member, um, then please do take one. Um, the leaflet describes who we are and what we do. Um, we were set up as a charity in 1967, um, so much younger than the AA. Um, but we, our aim is to promote research and understanding of landscape. Um, we've recently, in fact, um, considered how we promote research. And we've come up with a research strategy. Um, and. I thought you might be interested to hear a little bit about that. After all, it's the, it's the strategy that we are, we, are, we are getting behind in terms of our um, encouragement of research and also in, in terms of our promotion of, of landscape and landscape education. So the aims of the strategy are to advance research which helps society to develop responses to the major chances and challenges it faces in the interests of securing more just and sustainable relationships between people and landscape. The themes, um, which of course are more ephemeral than the overall aim, um, but the current themes are landscape injustice, rapid environmental change, short-termism and narrow franchise in landscape governance and new ways of thinking about landscape. And we're establishing some new methods for delivering this. We haven't previously had a formal scheme for sponsoring research, although it's only in a small way because we're only a small charity. 
Um, but we've also recently appointed a development manager, who I hope is here somewhere, Sarah, at the back there, uh, Sarah Mac McCarthy, who um, is now working for us three days a week. Um, largely because, I, I, I have to say, because of the success of our journal, Landscape Research, um, which goes to eight issues in 2015. Um, and therefore, of course, that provides an income stream to, to the charity. So, um, if you aren't members of uh, Landscape Research, do the Landscape Research Group, please do take a leaflet and consider joining and also consider encouraging others to do so. Which brings me to tonight's speaker, Professor Jackie Burgess. Um, Jackie is really quite special to the Landscape Research Group. Um, she was its chair from 1993 to 2000, and she became an honorary life member in 2001. And in many ways, she sowed the seeds of our current success. She is Emeritus Professor at the University of East Anglia and currently Vice Chairman of the Norfolk Broads Authority, which is part of the National Parks family. She worked at the University College London, just around the corner, um, since the 1970s, uh, and was awarded a personal chair in 1998. And I, I wanted to try and capture something uh, of, of, of uh, the change that she brought. Um, and I've, I've chosen this sentence from, from her own, or I, th I think it's an autobiography. She said that through research and teaching to promote the development of a strand of cultural geography relevant to planning and environmental policy. She also pioneered participatory research, including uh, the in-depth discussion groups method, um, and applied that um, notably with, with Carolyn Harrison um, and others uh, to conservation situations and also to the problem of radioactive waste storage. <coughs> I suppose that adds up to a world view and it was one that inspired me um, in 1998 when I first met Jackie in Clamberis. I was then a silviculturist for the Forestry Commission and um, she was doing research for the Countryside Commission uh, using the group method um, and it was just exactly what the Forestry Commission needed at the time. Um, the research method involved real people taking them out into the wood and actually gathering what they thought about their experiences. She seemed to challenge modernism and reductionist thought more generally I don't know if you heard the Reith lectures this week, but uh, a, a rather similar theme came out uh, about, about medicine and about the rather um, reductionist way that it's divided into disciplines and into in individual problems and how what it really needs is systems. Um, Jackie famously, um, well, I think it was famous, talked about um, reductionism as opposed to contextualism. Um, there are many other ways of expressing this, um, but that was what she brought and I, th I, I, I took that on really quite wholeheartedly and in fact studied with Jackie um, for an MSc and um, then set up what is now the Social and Environmental Research Group within the Forestry Commission's research organisation. Recently, um, Yes, she retired from um, University of East Anglia, joined the Broads Authority, and she's going to speak tonight um, based on her experiences at the Broads Authority and drawing on that wonderful theoretical background. She's going to talk about valuing wetlands and wetland values. Jackie, please. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and um, thank you all for, for coming. My personal and professional life has been embedded in fens, bogs, 
and marshes, particularly along the East Coast and the Thames Estuary. And I've always been fascinated by these ambiguous landscapes, part land, part water, with a powerful reputation for mystery, for crime, for insalubrious goings on, and landscapes which offer significant development opportunities, ranging from good locations to site noxious industries in the 19th and 20th century, productive soils if drained for intensive cereal production, and extensive housing and commercial development land in the 21st century. A lot of my research career has been tied up with these landscapes, and I was involved in major projects while I was at UCL, myself, colleagues, and um, generations of graduate students. We had, for example, very close involvement with the MCA Universal Studios attempt to develop a theme park on rain and marshes, SSSI, Site of Special Scientific Interest, back in 89 and 90 where we were focusing on the role of national and local media in terms of the circulation of conflicting claims about the value of the site and of the development and how local people made sense of these different claims in the light of their own situated knowledge and experience. Raynham was important for lots of reasons, not least because it introduced into planning for the first time the idea of biodiversity offsetting compensating for the loss of nature conservation value in one place by recreating or protecting it somewhere else. In the Raynham case, it was an offer for 10,000 acres of grazing marsh down the estuary. It's one of those quirks of fate that MCA caught fire, that the Raynham development never happened, and some 10 or 12 years later, the RSPB actually acquired the site and have turned it into a major nature conservation area. It's an interesting history. Secondly, we were very involved um, in projects that were looking at payments to farmers for wildlife and landscape benefits and enhancements. And we were working in the mid-90s on what was known as the Pevensey Levels Wildlife Enhancement Scheme. This is where farmers were being paid to manage grazing marshes for wildlife benefit, and particularly for the benefit of the Fenraft spider which is the biggest spider in terms of Britain and very rare. There are only three sites where you find this beast. And we were working alongside environmental economists from Newcastle in a project for English Nature to see if it was possible to justify the wildlife enhancement scheme via people's willingness to pay to save the farming, to save the, the spiders and to save the marshes. And that project began an occasionally bruising set of encounters with environmental and later with ecological economists. Conversations about the limits and the limitations of monetizing nature and landscapes. Following my move to the School of Environmental Sciences at UEA in 2006, I found myself head of a department which also included some of the world's leading environmental economists. Partly through that, I was invited to join the expert panel overseeing the U UK's National Ecosystem Assessment. And together with Andrew Church and Neil Ravenscroft, I became, in the jargon of these assessments, a coordinating lead author for cultural services. The challenge, as it's always been, is how best to capture the range of knowledges, meanings, values and uses that are deployed in deciding what to do with land and water and how to ensure that decisions are competent, cost-effective, fair and open to scrutiny. And that's a particularly interesting set of challenges for me now as I'm thoroughly embedded in the policy world as the Vice Chair of the UK's only National Wetland Park. So in the lecture what I want to do is first of all draw out the distinction between values and valuation. And I should begin by outlining what I see as a cultural perspective in distinguishing wetland values. We will then turn to the rise of economic valuation as part of a new way of framing human environment relations. This new way is entitled Ecosystem Services. And it's a perspective which actually mobilizes a metaphor of nature 
as consisting of a fixed stock of natural capital which can sustain a limited flow of ecosystem services. And what I want to do is to focus on the UK's national ecosystem assessment and the claims being made for ESA as a powerful new decision tool for policy appraisal in relation to environmental management. Thereafter, we're going to get our boots muddy by focusing much more specifically on wetland habitats and landscapes, exploring how the ecosystem services approach is playing a part in reframing national character area profiles and then what impact it might be having in a specific place, which in my case is the Broads National Park. So if we're going to start with marshes, we can only start with Dickens. And I'm sure you will all recognise this evocation. It's all negative marsh tropes that we've come to know and love. The raw cold, dank dusk, the dark flat wilderness, the leaden river, the savage lair of the sea, death, mortality and terror. Hold your noise, cried a terrible voice as a man started up from amongst the graves at the side of the church porch. Keep still, you little devil, or I'll cut your throat. Which is a very good way of introducing ourselves to marshes. So what does a cultural perspective mean? And what kind of cultural, cultural approach have really I tried to do in my career with my colleagues and very especially with my graduate students? And it's a cultural perspective which pays attention to communication. I apologise for talking about critical discursive spaces this afternoon, it's a bit jargon ridden. But I've been fascinated always by representations, by Dickens, by the ways in which we talk about particular landscapes and the kinds of deliberations, the kinds of arguments that people have in different places about why these sorts of things matter. And always at the same time, wanting to tie those to existing social practices, what we do in relation to these kinds of landscapes and resources. And always understanding those discourses and practices as being context specific, dependent on particular places at particular times, and also being dynamic. I think this is an approach which appreciates the importance of history, it appreciates the importance of geography, and it understands how these things are constantly being contested and changing. The phrases we used to use at the time when I was actively involved is with cultural politics, that people were fighting and contesting over meanings and actions. And these are just two quotes that have always been, for me, lodestars, if you like, in the terms of the ways in which I think about these things. The tradition comes very much from um, Richard Hoggart, from Raymond Williams, and from Stuart Hall and the Centre for Contemporary Cultural Studies. So it's linking meanings and actions, which is what Stuart Hall's quote, I think, catches here. And then secondly, it's trying, or what I've been trying to do, is to understand tensions and relations between different kinds of knowledges, between expert knowledges and those knowledges of ordinary people and understanding how values emerge through those sorts of processes. And I think what's really important here is understanding values as a way of developing a sense of the proper conduct. Values are things we reason towards, if you will, and they are about rightness and wrongness in terms of what we do. So we'll start with Essex. <laughs> That seems like a good place to start. Um, this is a recent book published, um, produced by Ken Walpole. He's a writer that I guess some people in the Architecture Association will know well. Um, he's a good friend, I think, of place and landscape and the importance of understanding these sorts of aesthetics. And the landscape photographer, Jason Norton. I think this is a really interesting book in terms of trying to explore modern sensibilities towards landscapes and aesthetics. And what Ken is talking about here is the kind of landscape aesthetic that I really have responded to very strongly in terms of my time at UCL. 
He talks about places that are vital, that are real, that are connected in terms of, as he says, industry, agriculture, leisure, recreation, ecology, and a tumultuous social history. He's talking specifically about the Lee Valley in this context and saying how they have a renegade aesthetics. It's not, it doesn't conform to elite standards of what constitutes a beautiful place, but it's absolutely fundamental to understanding people's attachments. And part of what Ken is talking about is the loss of that, the destruction of that landscape through the Olympic Park and the movement of 2010 to 2012 to clean it up, to turn it into a big development opportunity, which is, of course, what the Olympics did. And what we can see, partly through that process, is that the Raynham Hollywood on Thames has reappeared. This is Hollywood on Thames, take two. The story, nicely put, I think, in terms of, of The Independent in 2012, Again, with our classic tropes, the Swanscombe Peninsula, it says in Kent, where 150 mile an hour trains tear past cows munching on alkaline grass in contaminated soil in the shadow of giant cranes and towers of shipping containers all overlooking the Thames estuary, but it doesn't scream Hollywood. And what we have here is that classic development opportunity of a bit of brownfield site a bit of Thames estuary grazing marsh, which has been used for cement extraction for various kinds of industrial activities, offering the same sort of big money development opportunities as Raynham did. We have the same numbers. This is a two billion pound project. It's going to create 27,000 jobs. It's going to create an exciting leisure facility with Hollywood glamour via the Paramount link. The only difference really between this and Raynham is that there is now the high-speed train, which there wasn't at the time of Raynham, that was part of the promise. Support is voiced by local councillors who see this as a tremendous development opportunities, but the Independent goes on to say, the plans are expected to meet opposition from environmentalists because of the potential damage to wildlife in the area. And right on cue, we have some wildlife. Rare jumping spiders. I love these stories. I think they're terrific. <laughs> Delay building works on the £2 billion park. This is from the mirror. It had to be halted um, in last summer so that a colony of extremely rare spiders could be rehomed. These things were found on this 172 acre brownfield site. They're a UK priority species. <laughs> And they're only found in one other place in the country, which is the West Thurrock marshes in Essex. And unlike many other spider species, they like the soil, which is particularly alkaline because of its previous industrial use. A wonderful example here of nature recolonizing um, from the kinds of activities that, that human activities undertaken. A couple of wonderful quotes. The Dartford Borough Council leader, Jeremy Kite said, and he's quoted in the paper, We've moved fish. We've sent voles away on holiday. It's fairly common and it protects them from the building works. Then when they're finished, they're brought back. And I love the ambiguity of when they're finished because the voles are already all dead. <laughs> Who knows what would happen to the spiders? And the developer's um, leader said, a guy called Tony Safton, we're doing a good thing. We will look after the spiders. And this appeal from developers to be protectors of nature is again a, a theme that ran through the whole Raynham case. What Mr Sefton is doing is appealing to a notion of proper conduct. We are doing a good thing in his developing relationship with these jumping spiders. That's one kind of value. Another sort of set of values have been captured through notions of landscape assessment. And these are scenic values, which have always been very important for the landscape research tradition. Now, as a member of the National Park family, the Broads, Broads enjoys protected area status. And our landscape officer, Leslie Marsden, have produced comprehensive and detailed assessments of our landscape quality. What's interesting here are the scenic values that have been identified for these kinds of marshland landscapes. 
remoteness and tranquility, enclosure, pattern and texture, sense of time, depth, accessibility and experience. So a very clear set of aesthetic values which are characteristic of the Halvergate marshes and most grazing marshes. And these are the criteria that come to express landscape character. Vast panoramic grazing marshes, meandering rivers, nature conservation interests and big skies. And you can see that in, in two photographs, typical photographs of our landscapes. I think it's worth noting in passing that with the scale of the government cuts to national park and protected area landscapes, Leslie is now only one of three specialist landscape officers left in the National Park family. And one other way of valuing wetlands um, comes through the joy and appreciation that people get from sharing the world with those other species, from non-human species. And I just thought I'd pick you December the 4th, 2006. Um, it's an extract from a beautiful new book by Mark Cocker. It's called Claxton. Field notes from a small planet. He happens to live in the village next door to mine, which is rather nice. And these are collections of the notes, the nature notes, that Mark Cocker writes for The Guardian. And what you have here is an intense, sensuous evocation of place, of landscape and wildlife. The sights, the sounds and the smells. This was reviewed in The Observer last Sunday, actually, by Richard Kerridge. Um, and he put his finger partly on what Mark Cocker does, which is to appreciate the interconnectedness of things, the signatures of the whole system. So he says how Cocker talks about moths in a trap that have fed on a variety of part plant life that seem in this to embody an entire landscape distilled into these small, exquisitely patterned envelopes of protein. Similarly, just as the blackbird's song is a distillation of the earthworms on which it feeds, and which produce the soil on which everything stands, Mark Cocker, through his work, is trying, but never crudely, to make the point that humans too are a manifestation of this constant interchange. As he says, young rooks are merely raucous black transmutations of worms. And then he remembers that he's eaten rook pie quite recently. So it's about connections. And I want to make a connection now. Environmental economics invites us to think about the Claxton marshes, their hydrogeochemical and biological processes and their species as equivalent to capital assets as stocks of natural capital from which flow an enormous range of goods and services which provide benefits to people, contributing to our welfare and well-being, which probably includes rook pie if we think about it. Now the UK has actually been pioneering in environmental economics, and especially in the context of contributing to government policy making. And it goes back to the 1980s with concern about sustainable development. Professor David Pierce from UCL and Ed Barbier published in 1989 a book called Blueprint for a Green Economy. It became universally known as the Pierce Report and contributed directly to the 1990 white paper, This Common Inheritance. Its central proposition was that the reason why economic growth is not sustainable is that markets fail to allocate resources properly and that issues relating to inter and intra-generational equity are actually issues around market failure. Now what the Pierce report was advocating and what the government of the time accepted was two things. That for private producers and consumers, the prices that they actually paid in markets needed to be adjusted for market effects on environmental resources. And that secondly, for the public sector, environmental values must be incorporated into decision-making structures. And that was to be done by 
extending cost-benefit analysis to all public investment decisions, introducing environmental conservation constraints into public investment programmes, and crucially, incorporating natural asset losses and gains into GDP accounts. That was in 1990, and as Norgard's published in an article in Ecological Economics in 2010 said, over the period of about 15 years, this eye-opening metaphor of thinking about ecosystems as functioning as natural capital from which the flow of goods and services follows, it's actually been transformed into a dominant model for environmental policy and management. How has that come to happen? One of the critical moments in, in the acceptance of ecosystem services and this way of thinking about it actually comes from the UN Global Assessment that, that began after Rio back in 92. And the crucial one here was the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment published in 2005. And what this was doing was assessing the consequences of ecosystem change for human well-being and the scientific basis for action needed to enhance conservation and sustainable use of those systems. This was a huge global effort, five years work by 1400 scientists who actually set themselves a task of assessing the state of the world's key ecosystems, looking at the drivers of ecosystem change and the implications of those changes for well-being. And they produced this um, dynamic multi-scale systems model, which will be extremely well known, I guess, to, to a number of you in the audience. Now, the crucial element that I want to pick up and work forward with is the way in which they defined ecosystem services, which is in the bottom left-hand box. And they've identified four. Ecosystems provide provisioning services, such as food, water, fiber and fuel, regulating services, such as climate regulation, water and disease regulation, cultural services, which are defined in terms of spiritual, aesthetic, recreation and educational benefits, and then supporting services, which are sort of primary production and soil formation. And this understanding of these ecosystem services really came to, to frame the way in which the assessment was done. And so UNAP itself says that what the ESA did was it allows clearer explanation of how changes in ecosystems influence human well-being, and it provides information in a form that decision makers can weigh alongside other social and economic information. The assessment found that 60% of its 24 ecosystem services were being degraded and seriously degraded over the period of the assessment. One of the things it advocated, um, it identified gaps of knowledge at, at national and local scales, and it said, many ecosystem services and even less information is available about the economic value of non-marketed services, i.e. all of those, but particularly then the cultural ones. Moreover, the cost of depletion of these services are rarely tracked in national economic accounts. It sought to encourage governments to take on the task, and the UK was the first to attempt a serious and thorough national level assessment, led by Professor Bob Watson, who was the MA coordinator, and Steve Oldman, with Ian Bateman and Kerry Turner as leading environmental economists. And this was a specialist team um, of natural scientists, social scientists, um, economists, who attempted to assess in a detailed way the contribution that the UK's ecosystems were providing to um, human well-being. And this is the kind of model, this is the model that evolved out of that process. The commitment absolutely to governance, and a commitment to valuation. And what you can see here in this bottom orange-red box is valuation is described in terms of economics, in terms of health, and then in terms of shared social values. And the smiley face is because we could never, at the end, find a way of quantifying 
own shared social values, and I'll come on to that in a minute. When the report was launched um, in 20, end of 2010-2011, um, the forward by John Selborne, Lord John Selborne, said that it represented a new way of estimating our national wealth. It shows we have undervalued our natural resources. Valuing them properly would enable better decision making, more certain investment, more avenues to wealth creation and jobs, and greater human well-being in the changing times ahead. The cultural services team actually had many problems. Um, we were a thorn in the side of the economists and the conservation biologists in particular, and we had a struggle, which was a two-year struggle, to try to communicate what it was that a cultural perspective meant in terms of ecosystems and nature. And the problem really stemmed from the fact that we couldn't see social values as being a sum of individual preferences, which is how an economist approaches um, cultural values. So if you sum what individuals like, that gives you the idea of societal values or social values. So the cultural, cultural um, understanding, if you like, was immensely difficult to try to communicate. There was a significant problem that we kept coming back to, was that ecosystems is not a term that people understand. It's an expert term. What people talk about is place, nature and landscape. And that's how these issues are being framed in terms of ordinary or popular discourse. And there's an immense problem of trying to quantify. This is a quantitatively driven decision-making system. So you need numbers. What kinds of numbers can you produce for cultural services? Well, if you're looking at tourism and recreation, you can find use-based numbers. You look at people's travel expenditure. What do, they, what do they spend getting to and from a beauty site, for example? People used a surrogate of house prices, finding that people will pay up to 10 to 15% more for houses that overlook green space or scenically attractive landscapes. We even went down the route of undertaking a lexicographical analysis, which produced data on the frequency with which words are used in different contexts to talk about environments and landscapes. So, this is an example of one of the um, major outputs, the whole of the NEA is littered with these kinds of summary assessment documents. Eight habitat types were selected, um, and as you can see, maybe, hopefully, mountains, heaths and moorlands, for example, um, semi-natural grasslands, and one, two, three, four, the fifth one across is freshwaters, wetlands and floodplains. And the dark colours indicate the importance of the habitat for delivering these services, the arrows indicate the direction of travel in terms of whether it's improving, holding steady or declining over the 60 years. Now the wetlands um, chapter, the wetlands assessment was undertaken um, by a team led by Ed Maltby and Steve Ormerud, both um, natural scientists. Natural England, its 2009 State of the Natural Environment report estimated that 2% of the land area of England was wetlands. Something like 273,000 hectares of coastal and floodplain grazing marsh, fen, lowland raised bog and reed beds. And of that, only 26% is protected. So the rest is open for development without any controls. The headline from the assessment, rivers, lakes, ponds, groundwaters and wetlands provide major services, but these benefits are inadequately identified, inadequately valued, and this is resulting in habitat losses amongst the fastest in the UK. Throughout history, each stage of agricultural intensification has seen a corresponding decline in the ecological value of habitats, such as flower-rich fen, traditional washlands and grazing marshes. And it's been very closely linked to changes in government agricultural policies. So as we will know, those of us who've been in the landscape field for a long time, 
Between 1945 and 1980, agricultural intensification was actively supported and driven by government policies. This was the time when there was a goal to become self-sufficient in food production. And the land which went under the plough most rapidly was grazing marsh and lowland fen because it was also the most fertile. If you got your land drainage system right, then you were able to produce intensive cereal crops and productions. Between the 1880s and 2000, there was actually some shift towards concerns about grain mountains, about overproduction. And we began to see a regime driven largely, it must be said, by EU and global initiatives to start to protect some of these landscapes. Through the Ramsar Convention, for example, on wetlands, the EU Birds Directive, the ESAs and countryside stewardship schemes. And we are now right on the cusp of a new generation, if you will, of these schemes under the new cap greening issues, which is just being finalised. So what we're going to be seeing in the next two to three years is a new round of agri-environment schemes. They used to be called NELMS. They're now increasingly being called Countryside Stewardship 2.0, I guess, because that's what it used to be called. So three of the UK's biodiversity action plan habitats are actually wetlands. Coastal and lowland grazing marshes are the top, and these are landscapes characterised by these kinds of qualities. Periodically inundated, they have ditches, often very ancient ditches, which divide the fields and they're used to control very complex water level regimes. They also involve very complex negotiations between farmers to negotiate how the water levels and the water flows are to be managed. The ditches are incredibly important for aquatic flora and fauna. They're also very important for um, overwintering and feeding birds. So in total, we have something like 235,000 hectares here of grazing marshes. What I've tried to do is to pick out the two kinds of wetlands that I'm most familiar with, the broads and the Greater Thames estuary. And the image is actually of an RSPB estuary looking um, north towards the Thames. The second of these wetland landscapes under the UK Biodiversity Action Plans are fens. And these are a very wide type of different sorts of landscapes, but the crucial thing about them is that the water tables are very close to the surface, to the ground level. They're characterised by species stands, particularly um, reeds and tall fen. Sphagnum moss will, will dominate in acidic fenlands. Um, it doesn't figure in alkaline fens, which is where you'll tend to get things like fen orchids, for example. And, and the Broads has 50% of the entire UK population for fen orchids. Um, and again, we've got something like 19,000 of these, um, 19,000 hectares in SSSIs. These, these are protected. The Broads is a major reservoir for fen landscapes. As you can see, there's very little left in terms of the Greater Thames estuary. And then reed beds. And these are the rarest of the wetland habitats. They actually um, create space for a series of iconic species, including booming bitterns, which um, everybody knows about, I think, in relation to the Norfolk Broads, marsh harrier. They're being used increasingly in the Broads as a form of flood defence. And we've developed pioneering ways of removing sediment and filling geotextile bags, and then that allows us to create new rebeds. Um, there's some disagreement in the literature. I couldn't find um, detailed figures of how much um, reed bed there is. So I thought I would just leave that at the national total for 2013. One of those lovely, funny connections. Reed beds used to be managed very intensively in the broads. The reeds and the sedge were used for thatching, but crucially, they were used for feeding and bedding London cab horses. And with the development of motorised transport, the market for Norfolk reed collapsed overnight. And one of the reasons our reed beds disappeared is because there wasn't the demand for the market that there used to be. 
And if anybody's interested in those historical, cultural, and geographical um, relationships, David Matlas, who's a um, professor of cultural geography at Nottingham, has just published a book which is called In the Nature of Landscape, and it's Cultural Geography of the Norfolk Broads. And I would strongly recommend it. It's, it's a fascinating study, really, really interesting. 20 years worth of research on, on, on these sort of histories and geographies. OK. So we have three very vulnerable habitats. Can monetary valuation actually help to save, protect, and reinstate them? And one of the key figures in this debate is Professor Kerry Turner. Kerry was the leading economist in the NEA. He's actually managed the economist's team in the Valuing Nature Network, which has been the follow-on study which has just been um, published. He was also a previous chairman of the Broads Authority. And Kerry's argument is here, and I think it's summarised very clearly in terms of the book. There's a market failure. Ecosystem services must be monetized, if at all possible, to ensure that they are properly and fully taken into account. And the argument is that you do your cost-benefit analysis and then you supplement that with deliberative processes if that's necessary. So what kind of market failures are we talking about? Um, John Bowers, who was an economist, um, an environmental economist back in, in the 80s and 90s, and a past president of the British Association for Nature Conservation, articulated very clearly the market failures in his response to peers. We all know about externalities, the ways in which um, the costs associated with economic activity can be exported into the environment, into the national world, without being paid for. So you think about water pollution, air pollution and acid rain um, and clean-up costs. So there are externalities. Everybody bears the costs of those activities. We all know about the tragedy of the commons, which is another kind of market failure, in which you have a common resource, which means that nobody pays which leads everybody to over-exploit that, that resource because they get individual gain at the expense of the whole group. But then there's a market failure which applies very directly to landscape. And John Bowers describes this as when the price can't be charged for the goods or the cost of production is zero at the margin so that any price is above the competitive price. Okay, and the example he uses is a farmer who changes their cropping regime, which creates a more attractive landscape. Now, that attractive landscape is viewed for free because that's what landscapes are. There are capacity to oversee a patch of land. Now, you're not able to, ex to grant exclusive rights. You can't buy that. You can't buy that view. So if a buyer can consume it without paying, then they're better off refusing to pay. So landscape is a common good. It's absolutely a public good at which individual landowners will invest to make changes, but they can't get a return on that investment. So the question becomes how to monetize some of these values, if it can be, in terms of a market context. Now, the way environmental economists think about this, and again, this comes back to Kerry Turner's work, the diagram comes from the NEA assessment, by the way, um, is to imagine a concept of total economic value. And what we have here is on the left-hand side of this diagram, we have direct use values. You want something, you go and pay for it, you pay a certain amount of money, and then you have the rights to use it. So it's around individual consumption, which is calibrated through the market and market prices. But as you move across towards the right-hand side of this diagram, life gets much more tricky, particularly when you start looking at non-use values. Bequest values, for example, the value of saving nature for future generations. The value that philosophers will argue is really important, sort of intrinsic value, 
from knowing that species or habitats or landscapes have a continued existence independent of one's own capacity to, con to consume those. Now, this is the sort of social value challenge, and it's the problem. So what's happened over this last 20, 25 years is there's been a major research effort to try to create hypothetical markets for non-use values. And the main technique is called contingent valuation. And this is where you use a questionnaire um, in which you ask individuals to respond to a hypothetical situation and then to say how much they would be willing to pay personally to prevent damage or to save a species. And it's used as a surrogate for non-use values. It gives you a range of monetary measures which can then be taken as being representative of those non-use values and they can be put into a cost-benefit analysis. There's a huge debate about this. Um, as you can imagine, it's a highly contested technique. But despite the refinements, and there have been refinements, it still exists as the only way of getting a monetary value into this kind of cost-benefit decision. So the ecosystem services approach through the, the National Ecosystem Assessment. The UK government embraced um, the ESA. It underpinned the 2011 Natural Environment White Paper, which was called the Natural Choice securing the value of nature. More crucially than that, it was actually backed up by supplementary guidance in the Treasury's Green Book in 2012. And this is probably the first time that the Treasury, which is a very conservative institution, has actually embraced something which is specifically to do with environment. So take that, that's a huge achievement actually, in terms of, of something that the NEA managed to achieve. Further than that, the government actually established an independent natural capital committee, chaired by Dieter Helm, who's a, an Oxford economist, to advise government about how to integrate the value of natural capital into decision making at all levels of policy and decisions. And it's funded major multidisciplinary research programmes that are going forward. A recent paper by um, John Turnpenny, um, Russell and Andy Jordan in 2014, which has just been published, actually looked at the way in which ESA knowledge is penetrating into policy and environmental impact assessments. It sampled between 28 and 2012. And what they found at that time is there were only limited use of an ESA approach. But in that approach, the main emphasis was on regulating services, i.e. climate and climate change, Cultural services were the least likely to be addressed. So we still have the same problem, really, that it's hard to get hold of cultural services and it's hard to know what to do with it. So how can we see an ESA, ESA approach going forward? Well, one of the things that has happened is that Natural England in the last few years has been revising its natural character area profiles. And what I've done here is to compare the broads with the Greater Thames Estuary. These have been produced um, by Natural England regional staff. They were commended by the Landscape Institute in 2013. They won one of the, the highly commended awards for integrating an approach that links environmental topics within a single spatial framework with the emphasis on linking landscape and ecosystem thinking. And that is actually what they have tried to do so we have these two landscapes, which are very similar, being described in terms of their provisioning services, their regulating services. And these are the examples that are used in the NCA. And then coming on, we actually find quite substantial attempts to capture cultural services, what it is that these landscapes are providing in terms of sense of place, in terms of sense of history, recreation, and interestingly, biodiversity. Biodiversity is being constructed here as a cultural service, not as a, a natural process, which is, I think, interesting. What is more interesting 
is that in terms of this construction of biodiversity, what we actually see here is a nature conservation discourse. So that biodiversity is accounted for in terms of size of SSSIs, in terms of numbers of species, in terms of rarity of species, and in terms of species diversity. These are all criteria that you would find in an expert nature conservation argument. They are not the kinds of cultural values that, again, ordinary people, inverted commas, would necessarily attribute to those habitats and those landscape types. But these are very interesting documents and, and I, I would strongly recommend that you have a look at them. They deal with landscape as well as with biodiversity. But what is very striking about them is that they show all the signs of political intervention. I was talking with um, one of the officers from the, the Norfolk and Suffolk team who wrote the Broads NCA. And what they talk about in this is about statements of environmental opportunities. And you read these and you think, in what sense are these opportunities? And talking with him, he said, well, actually, we wanted to talk about policy objectives, but we weren't allowed to. So it got downgraded from a commitment to this is what we want to achieve to a, here's a good suggestion, this might be an opportunity. It's only a matter of words, but I think these are very important changes in terms of those words. Nor do they say anything about payment for ecosystem services, which brings us back to how you're going to deliver these things and what is it that they're doing. So the basic issue here is about dealing with market failure and an argument that an ESSA, ESA approach allows you to assess the real costs of providing these services to societies and contributing to human well-being. And this is just one example. It's, um, it was published this year, 2014, in Ecology and Evolution. And it's actually a work-through example of an ecosystem services assessment. It produces um, real numbers, real numbers, for five um, different components of an ecosystem services using a thing called TESSA which is a tools kit for a rapid site scale assessment. It's only using numerical quantified data, so cultural services um, get caught up in terms of tourism, again, so who's visiting the site. But what's interesting about it is its conclusion. It finds that the value of converting arable land to restored wetland gives a yield of £129 more per hectare of this land. In other words, it's more valuable to that level if it's converted to wetland than if it's kept to arable because of the range of other services that wetland provide, you know, like storing up um, carbon, for example. But what I find interesting is what they say about the distributional effects. Under arable production, a small number of landowners and their employees gain the majority of the ecosystem service benefits provided by the site, as well as a sizable direct subsidy from the taxpayer, estimated at something like £259 per hectare per year. Consumers are also beneficiaries, but restoration has only a marginal impact under them. But then, under restoration, there is greater societal benefit to a much broader range of stakeholders Yet most of the benefits do not accrue to the landowner, who in the absence of related incentives such as carbon payments, is therefore encouraged to continue arable production. So it really is a trade-off here between private and public benefits. And the ecosystem services analysis has actually brought that into focus and relief. The report went down actually very well in our region. This is our local paper with a very reasonable report about it, very fair, suggesting that some of our farmers actually begin to consider this. The other story here is talking about the pressures on the broad marsh farmers. 
And that's what I want to come into in the final part of, of what I'm talking about. The Broads Authority pioneered um, the development of agri-environment schemes in which farmers are paid to forego profits by maintaining their grasslands and by keeping them under low intensity grazing regimes. The Broads Grazing Marsh Scheme was set up in 1985. Tim O'Reardon did this lecture last year. Tim was the key pioneer who fought the battle for Halvergate Marshes, which became an absolute cause celebre, really, in terms of trying to maintain a landscape and biodiversity focus. The Broads Environmentally Sensitive Area, and we've got problems with clashes of acronyms here, so <clears throat> was designated in 87. It went into stewardship, and it extends now over 43,000 hectares. And there are scaled payments to landowners for managing their grasslands with different levels of commitment to conservation. So these are just a couple of maps to show you the extent of, of my patch. And the ESA runs down through all of the river valleys. The Broads is basically a sink for most of Norfolk. Um, and these are the main river valleys that come down and most of that land is under ESA. And this is a second um, more intense focus on that. So you can see the red dots are tier one land. So that's permanent grassland. Um, and tier four, which are the dark ones, which is where there has been an arable reversion to permanent grassland. So that's where farmers have actively taken arable land out of production and put it back to permanent grassland. What we are desperately worried about is that with the changes to the agri-environment scheme, with the new cap greening process, which is going to be less money, that's, that's one of the important things, that our farmers are going to pull this land back out of the conservation and will start to plough again and start to intensify. And we have already had four applications at planning committee specifically to do that. Now, some of our farmers have been very committed um, to being inside an ESA and are using this as a way of adding value to their production. So this is Mr. Brooks. He's one of the largest landowners on Halvergate Marshes. And you can see in his quote, this is a quote from the website, how he's using um, the Broads National Park and the Ramsar site and the, the designation as a way of adding value to his product. You know, we produce Norfolk beef, which has these credentials. But the key here is in the last little paragraph. Recognising challenges brought about by the reform of the CAP, we're having to make adjustments to the livestock enterprise to enable sustainability. Now, the Broads Authority are very worried about this. And our members received a report from um, our senior ecologist in September last year, which itself was framed in terms of ecosystem services. And so the paper from our ecologist said, the National Parks are advocating an ecosystem services approach and setting priorities around value for money, meaning more targeted biodiversity and landscape benefits. So our 21 members, some of whom are Secretary of State appointees like me, some are local councillors and have political appointments, being confronted for the first time with an ecosystem services approach and having to debate that and decide what it is that we do. So it was described to us in one of our papers in these terms um, that the impact will be if farmers decide to play increased nutrient enrichment, increased use of pesticides, carbon losses and lower land levels. On the cultural side, cultural services, the emphasis really is around how important our landscapes are for, we have an organic industrial landscape, if you like, that, that's absolutely what the Broads landscape is about, that we will lose heritage value, that we will lose the aesthetics in terms of what people come to say. Now, the members debated this and approved two courses of action which have been undertaken over the last 
year. The first is that we commissioned research um, from farm conservation to undertake a survey of farmers who are within the ESA schemes to find out what it was that they would do under the changes in policy. And what we find is that many are already deciding to intensify management as the environmental stewardship payments fall. A relatively small number of farmers, we've got something like 480 farmers who farm some element of grazing marsh land in their holdings. Only 56 of those responded, which tells us something to start with. Only 12% responded. So we don't know what 88% of the others are intending to do. And the fact they didn't respond, I think, is quite significant. From the farmers who responded, only a limited number said that they intended to plough up. And the reasons why they were going to maintain their existing patterns of production are complicated. They're to do with tradition, with ownership of stock that they don't want to get rid of, with familiarity with this kind of pastoral farming or mixed farming, which is what it tends to be, the fact that the drainage would present too many challenges in terms of their land, and crucially, a love of the landscape and the wildlife. And there are some really telling comments that come back through telephone interviews and discussions about how attached these farmers feel to the wildlife that, that is on their land that they share their lives with. But 46 of those who responded, and we can assume that these are people who are pro-conservation and pro-landscape heritage, 46% said they will make changes and those changes will mean additional nutrient applications to the grassland. In other words, we're going to get more nitrogen, more phosphate onto the grassland, which is right next door to the rivers and right next door to the ditches. So fen and reed thrives on low nutrient levels. So there will be changes that will impact on water quality as well as biodiversity. And the other things they're going to do is that they say that they will lower the water levels in the dikes to reduce the risks of liver fluke, which is an issue for the cattle. That will mean lower levels that a lot of the aquatic plants and invertebrates that thrive on a particular level of water in these ditches will be under threat. There's great uncertainty about the policies and great uncertainty about payments or not. And there is a debate what the new greening proposals under CAP are going to do is they're going to pay farmers for much more specific biodiversity outcomes you will actually provide land that will produce overwintering feeding grounds for birds. And I was very reminded reading some of this and listening to Natural England when they came to talk to us. When we interviewed farmers back in the Pevensey Levels in 1994 about the Wildlife Enhancement Scheme, a farmer in one of the discussion groups that we ran with the farmers sat there and he said, we're not growing food anymore, we're growing bloody plovers. <laughs> There was a huge issue there about what farming is about and what farming is for. The other thing we're doing is that we're going for a landscape partnership bid. This is a three million pound bid from the Heritage Lottery Fund, which is now funding projects which seek to maintain landscapes. They seek to re-engage communities with those landscape assets. They look at reskilling in terms of traditional skills. They look at education and the role that landscapes can play in educational um, contributions, both formally at school and informally to other communities. This bid is going in in um, May 2015. And if we're successful, we've built a partnership with something like 60, 70 local organizations. And it's a 200 square mile area from Norwich to Great Yarmouth and Lower Stoft and covers the main river valleys. Watch this space. So, how to conclude? I'm very reminded all the time that I deal now with the policy world and, and I have to say, this is the first academic lecture I've given for four years. <laughs> when I retired, I walked away um, and I have really struggled in the last few months to put this together 
in a way that I hope makes sense academically as well as in policy terms. But what I keep finding myself thinking about is Donald Worcester's comment. Um, most of you will know his wonderful book called Nature's Economy, which came out, second edition was published back in 1994. And the quote from there, and it's a quote that I managed to get into the ecosystem assessment, technical report, was along the lines of, every generation writes its own account of the natural order. But we're left with incongruous bits and pieces of previous ways of understanding. And I think that's absolutely where we are right now. I think we are in the middle of a 20th stroke 21st century rewriting of the national order. And that is being dominated by systems and by a systems way of thinking. And what we find is an increasing domination in the context of an earth systems approach, a global, powerful approach, which is able to model, it's able to measure with enormously powerful predictive capacity. And that's what's driven IPCC and the climate change debate and issues around climate. And climate, the atmospheric earth system interaction, is, if you like, the prime example of that. But what the MEA is, what the Millennium Ecosystem was, was an attempt to do the same thing, to provide a systems approach, but looking at ecosystems as a way of understanding that sort of global interest, looking for modelling, which is very difficult, looking for measurement, looking for predictive capabilities. That systems perspective is allied to um, if we want to be grand about it, so sort of neoliberal capital and neoliberal economics, um, a way which leaves the market in total control because that's the kind of world that we now live in. But it's one in which economic instruments have an increasing domination, if you will, in terms of ability to influence policy, ability to understand the impacts of human activities on these systems. And you can see that penetration again through carbon trading, through permits to pollute. It's provided us with a very powerful set of instruments that allow the regulation and fit very nicely within this systems perspective. And where we are right now is that we're seeing this downscaling to national and to regional and even to, to local levels is the argument. So, secondly, what the ecosystem services framing does, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not entirely negative about it, it encourages us to think about interconnectedness, and I think that's a very important positive for the first time. As you've seen from the examples I've talked about, we are thinking in a, in a more sophisticated way about what nature and the environment provides for human well-being, but also, by implication, what human activity does to those systems. And it's not a comfortable story, if you like, in terms of, of decline and degradation. So it means we start thinking more clearly about the co-production, if you will, of value. It reminds me a bit of, you know, well, what, what's nature done for me? We can now show what nature does for me. But the point is about the ecosystem services approach is that those uses and values which can be monetized are the ones that are privileged in decision making. Because our decision making, policy decision making in the UK and elsewhere, notwithstanding rhetorical claims about deliberation, and I think they are only rhetorical claims, is dominated by cost-benefit analysis, 95% of environmental impact assessments are cost-benefit analysis assessments. Look at the arguments about flooding and where should we invest in flood defence. So we have a system which is dominated by cost-benefit analyses which themselves are stripping out those other ways of knowing and other ways of value, other capacities to, to see. And what I think we're getting to is that we're getting to a kind of new hegemonic moment in a way, in that it's no longer possible to have a public debate in which subjective values, aesthetic values, 
beauty, attachment, emotion has a place. I find it really interesting that our landscape partnership bid is going to the Heritage Lottery Fund, which is funded by people gambling. <laughs> Isn't that an irony? <laughs> I find that really peculiar. Not by a public body. So we have a distribution of surplus assets that come from people gambling. And what benefits those people will get from this, I don't know. The other thing that strikes me, and I've been reflecting on this a lot while I've been preparing this lecture, is there is no longer, it seems to me, any kind of protest about what's happening. I have lived my career through the last 40 years when the 70s and the 80s and the 90s were marked by direct action and people mobilising, people getting out there and fighting. You may remember Swampy and the road schemes or Tim Arredon and the Halbergate marshes. There's no protest anymore that seems to be effective. Now maybe that's because I am no longer connected and one of the reasons I stopped being an academic is because I don't understand this new world. Maybe there are protests around social media but it's very hard I think to find people standing up and being able to fight and to articulate. That's what I mean. I think we have reached a new hegemony in which the monetized value is the only value that counts in terms of landscapes and I think that's something that we need to try to contest if we can to keep the flame of landscape alive if you like in what I see as being really quite difficult times. Thank you very much. Hi there, uh, Dean Philpot of the Thames Estuary Partnership which is based Hi. around the corner. Um, I'm the project officer for the Greater Thames Marshes Nature Improvement Area, um, which is a pilot scheme funded by Natural England, a three-year pilot scheme um, to designed to contribute towards the Biodiversity 2020 objectives. Um, you mentioned the sort of um, dissolving of uh, governments down to regional and local level. Um, I'm wondering, in terms of your experience, what advice you would have in terms of other sources of funding and um, direction forward as we come to the um, the end of the third year of my of this project, um, and we we start to talk about re rewriting a, um, a business plan and stuff like that, and okay. talking about ecosystem services and what to contribute. So I just thought I'd ask for advice, basically. Only a small question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I it's very interesting. I was involved with the Thames Estuary Partnership when I was at UCL. Um, and I guess like most of these, you're essentially sort of public authorities and voluntary organisations. I'm not sure what kind of private sector involvement that, that you have in that. It seems to me that, that the main way forward still at the moment is probably through Section 106 agreements or whatever will replace those. Um, I think listening to the arguments, and there are other people in the audience who may know better than me, about what the new greening proposals are going to be under, under the cap, there may be some value in trying to build relationships with individual landowners who may then be able to apply for that kind of funding. I think the Heritage Lottery Fund is a, is a good way forward, but the issue I guess is always about um, revenue funding as opposed to capital funding, isn't it, in terms of projects, which is a challenge. I don't have, I don't have a, a, an easy answer. I don't think any of us have. Yeah. We're all of us trying to build partnerships. The biggest headline news with the national parks is that we've managed to do a sponsorship deal with Airwick. <laughs> and Airwick is now marketing aerosols, which are Lake District um, smells. The Broads <laughs> one is Meadow Sweet. Now, what are we coming to <laughs> when actually, so maybe you could market, perhaps you could find a sponsor for the Thames Estuary. <laughs> I, I think we're all of us. My boss actually recently mentioned London Pride, yeah. the, the drink. They've just uh, made, made it, created a new ad and it yeah. greatly promotes the Thames Estuary in that ad. So, Yeah, I mean... <laughs> It's what Ken Walpole talks about in, in the New English landscape. We, we are in a really strange place. And I don't think any of, the, any of the certainties, you know, these estuary partnerships were fantastic. 
in terms of the way they brought all these different partners together, the way they managed to resolve competing interests. But how we move forward in the new world, I don't know. Um, okay. Sorry, that's not that's, my that's fine. answer. Thank you. I don't um, know. Tim over there. Yeah. Get the microphone to him. Thanks, Jackie. That was a wonderful presentation. I've got a, a bit of a messy question. So as I understand it, economic values are really engaged with the material world and our, and our ability to quantify what's going on in the material world. And the complication is when they're juxtaposed against human values, which are non-material and, um, and much more difficult to quantify. So that's the basic struggle. Now, what occurs to me is when I look at systems like this, um, there's a couple things that have come up. One is um, John Murray in Edinburgh has written recently about the Gallic language. And he talks about um, cultural ecologies that can be ground truths, yeah? Mm. And that really resonated with me because when I read the ecosystem services cultural analysis, I start to slip and slide, you know, with, with the human value side of the equation. But when you talk about the Norfolk Broads, you talk about David Mantlis, I know Simon Reed, mm -hmm. you know, I know contemporary cultural production that's deeply embedded in the Norfolk Broads. Yeah. And I'm sure there's a history of it. I'm sure there's a record of it. So, and I guess, so I guess the question for me is, we've learned to assess biodiversity over the last 40 years. And so the, the, the question that's in the back of my mind is, do we need to rethink what it means to assess uh, cultural ecologies themselves? And do we need to be able to ground truth them in both historical terms, mm -hmm. present terms, and future potentialities? I think that's fascinating. Yeah. And it's, it's to do it, I think that's what I mean about keeping the flame alive, it's to do it alongside the dominant discourse, alongside the dominant practice. Um, the distressing, part of the distressing thing is that the first recommendation is in the 2011 white paper was that we will support more research by multidisciplinary teams to progress, you know, the, the wonderful, I can't get the right words, but, but the insights that we've gained. And what you saw was massive investment in the Valuing Nature Network. NERC has now got, the Living with Environmental Change Programme has now um, engaged all the research councils, so that includes the Arts and Humanities Research Council, in a £6.5 million programme which is Valuing Nature. Now we all know that the money that's been put into that will then not be matched by money elsewhere. So what it means is that other ways of developing research and taking those things forward are going to have to be done by individual researchers or by very small scale funding or even perhaps going to Europe because within the UK science policy establishment and the research councils you know, are, are really important to that, this is where the action is. This is where it's going to go forward. And you also know very well, 6.5 million over five years with all of those disciplines and scientists, the huge bulk of the money will go to natural scientists and economists because that's the way the world works. Um, I think, here's why I like, that's why I like Mark Cocker, why I'm really, I really love the way in which people like him and Richard Maybe and those other voices on, on the edge are keeping alive other ways of understanding. And that does come back to intrinsic value. I'm just reading a beautiful book um, on Fenraft spiders. It's called On the Margins, um, and it's by a scientist called Helen Smith, and an artist, and I've lost her surname, it's Sheila, and her surname's just gone. And this is a book-length account of their engagement with the Fenraft spiders that live in Redgraven Lopham Fen. And the book is beautiful. It's beautiful for the passion with which the scientist writes about the fen, its landscape and its species, and the very critical way in which the artist talks about how she 
represented and has produced works of art based on this landscape and based on this spider. I'd really recommend that, that you have a look at it. It's on the margins and it, it's Peterborough Press, Lang Langford Press, I think it's called. And that, I, th I think, Tim, is, is, is what you're talking about. I think we have to maintain this tradition because it will come back, you know, a number of us in the room are old enough to have seen the way the pendulum swings. But I think it has to be an oppositional movement. It's not going to be mainstream. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the kind of answer I would give. And it's going to be down to next generation <laughs> to do that. I'm going to take... I'm going to take one more question because we are we are uh, out of time. We've, we've, um, I mean, I could, I really wish we could we could carry on all evening because I think this is a fascinating discussion following a fascinating lecture. But Peter, would you please take the last question, having announced who you are, in case none <laughs> of, of course. us know? And Peter Howard, Cultural Landscape, Bournemouth University, um, or at least uh, now retired. Um, it was one was just a comment just at the last moment you were saying about the amount of demonstration and so on uh, you mentioned swampy from my part of well i think to some extent you're quite right in supposing that that is now happening on the internet mm. i'm i'm slightly concerned with the organization called save our woods and their internet campaign to reverse the forestry uh, was surprisingly at least half successful. And I, I suspect that's now where, where that kind of demonstration is, even if I, and possibly others of my age, scarcely understand it. But the other thing I want to say was, what gives me real concern is that, is that you are so concerned about one of the most protected landscapes in the United Kingdom. Absolutely. And I come from the middle of Devon, which is completely unprotected in yeah. every possible way. And, and we have the added problem that, in a sense, we're facing a, a weird alliance yeah. between, on the one hand, developers who, who wish to put up windmills, et cetera, et cetera, all sorts of other developments, um, largely supported by the ecological management uh, and officers who, of course, quite reasonably, uh, will support those areas which pay them their money, yeah. which are the national parks and the AONBs and the SSSAs and so on. Mm. I think that's very interesting, Peter. I mean, there are a number of things just to respond to that. I mean, I do think, I mean, planning and landscape regulation has just been torn up. You know, um, the Chief Planning Officer for England has said recently, we might as well just tear up the rest of them because it is now so chaotic. It's incredibly difficult to know what applies where. The National Planning Framework sort of started that, but it's become a free-for-all, you know, with the presumption that development will go ahead unless there are very powerful reasons against it, these community plans. So there's a free-for-all there. We are still lucky in the protected landscapes and that we can still just about hold the line. Our problems is that, are that we, we are suffering death by a thousand cut. Nearly 40% cut in National Park grant um, is a huge amount to take. Um, the staff are now stretched to their limits in terms of what they can do. I do find it remarkable that we've only got three specialist landscape officers left. You know, that, that's a very telling statistic, I think. Um, I agree with you about, I think it's one of the reasons why I retired. <laughs> I have always been fascinated by popular culture, as you know. You can only do popular culture when you're close to it. And I don't understand, I've never tweeted in my life, I don't understand the kind of world that is now in existence, that's coming into existence. And I think the only right and proper thing for an elderly academic who doesn't understand the modern world is not to pontificate about popular culture, but retire and go and do something else. <laughs> the third thing and the final thing I wanted to say, I, I, I love being the other side of the fence. Now, it's absolutely fascinating being in a senior policy position. Um, what strikes me 
is that the, 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 the different scales at which these things apply. Cost-benefit analysis is absolutely a national tool. Do you want to answer it? <laughs> right. <laughs> and at national government, treasury level, cost-benefit analysis is what it takes. That's what they do. What I find interesting are these um, motherhood and apple pie appeals to deliberation and engaging stakeholders. As if we, at a local level, don't do that. What has struck me most about being on the Broads Authority is that we're like a family with our stakeholders. We know exactly who's going to fight us, on what issue. We have to spend enormous amounts of time working on the face work, building those social relationships, protecting them, as all of us know who are involved in these local sort of, sorts of issues. And so we have again a sort of mismatch. We're being given a new language and it's a language that we're being told we have to speak in. But going and talking to our navigation committee about ecosystem services, you know, forget it. They, they won't understand what we're talking about, nor, nor should they necessarily want to. But I just wanted to end because I think this is a really nice little epitaph for us in the meeting. The Broads is not a national park. It's a member of the national park family. And the reason we are not a national park is that we are a navigation authority. We have to manage the navigation. And so we have the two national park duties plus the duty of navigation. Now, right now, that's helpful because nearly half of our income, a bit less, 42%, is coming from navigation tolls. So we've got a tax on the water users which is contributing to, the, to funding the Broads Authority. But... Those toll payers are then expecting to see that money spent on navigation interests, which means that we dredge like mad. We are currently out to consultation to ask whether or not we should brand ourselves as the Broads National Park. Because the value of having that international brand for our tourism is immense. 500 million a year comes into our economy through tourism. We are sitting on the most internationally renowned brand of landscape and environment. You saw the Beckwith Farms, you know, we are in the Broads National Park. I had a letter yesterday from um, the president of one of the yacht clubs who says something like, the national parks were set up to protect natural beauty. Because the broads are man-made, there isn't any natural beauty. <laughs> and I just thought, that's wonderful, and I'd like to leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. Well, for me, that's lived more than lived up to expectations in terms of the usual clarity that Jackie brings. And... Uh, and also the level of challenge. I certainly feel challenged and I'm sure there are many of you who will go away and debate as we shall many of the issues that came up tonight. So thank you very much, Jackie. Thank you. Thanks.